Hello, Dr. Simon Freilich back with the Clinical Neurophysiology channel. In this video, I'm going to be addressing the subject of consciousness and looking at it from the perspective of sleep, wakefulness and awareness. Now, this is a particularly challenging subject. I'm not going to promise to give you the answer to what consciousness is. We're going to be skimming on its surface, much as we have already with sleep and wakefulness. Um, but these are really vital questions in our understanding of our basic biology and how we function. So what is consciousness, what is wakefulness, and what is awareness? These are our real fundamental questions and problems that we all struggle with here within the scientific community. So um, we are very blessed here in the UK. We have the NHS National Health Service and their website, which helps introduce um, patients and their families to a variety of topics, um, is very helpful. And they have an overview on the disorders of consciousness. So I'll just take you through uh, some aspects of this. So it says here that consciousness requires both wakefulness and awareness, which is certainly very true. Um, wakefulness is the ability to open your eyes and have basic reflexes such as coughing, swallowing and sucking. Fair enough. And awareness is associated with more complex thought processes and is more difficult to assess, which is very true, but a little bit woolly. Now, um, it carries on and says that the main disorders of consciousness are coma, vegetative state and the minimally conscious state. And I think they're missing a couple um, from the main disorders list as a practicing physician, someone who's gone through general medicine. I can certainly tell you there are plenty of patients who come through um, the service with delirium, where there's an acute disorder of consciousness in relation to a metabolic or an infective upset. So that should really be on the list. In addition to which, there should also be some consideration for those who may have dementia, whether in its advanced stages, or for those who have specific dementias, where there can be hallucinations too. So um, that's an interesting way to start thinking about it. So consciousness requires both wakefulness and awareness. Now, moving on into a more complex document where the great and the good of neurology um, are trying to um, explain how we should uh, categorize and manage those with prolonged disorders of consciousness. Um, so really talking about those who may have a, a vegetative state or many con minimally conscious state, um, so they start off with definitions. So it's very important to understand your definitions. And they say that consciousness is an ambiguous term encompassing both wakefulness and awareness, as uh, our NHS website had uh, alluded to. Wakefulness is a state in which the eyes are open and there is a degree of motor arousal. It contrasts with sleep, a state of eye closure and motor quiescence, which I struggle with because it seems to imply that wakefulness is the opposite of sleep. Um, awareness is the ability to have and the having of experience of any kind. Very, very difficult from a, a definition uh, perspective to try and capture all of this, which is fair enough, but we're going to really focus on this wakefulness and sleep and are they truly the opposites of each other because we are going to discover in very rapid order that one can be asleep and uh, still be awake and one can be awake and asleep at the same time and so these are not necessarily two polar ends of a spectrum and there can be coexistence of the two and it can happen far more commonly than people are often aware of. So the first thing to, to really say is in terms of um, sleep, wakefulness, consciousness, awareness, basically you need to have um, an intact brain. Um, we know that in terms of sleep, the sleep centers, we know that the hypothalamus is very important, the th thalamus, um, brainstem, cortex, they all have to be functioning and integrating with each other effectively. Um, in an appropriate way in order for all of the very complicated things that happen during sleep and its regulation to occur uh, properly. So let's first start uh, talking about intrusion of wakefulness into sleep. So perhaps the most common example of this is the confusional arousal. Um, you can have a go at this yourself if you have any children. Um, once they are um, well asleep, try waking them up. Uh, pick them up perhaps and, and ask them to start walking the way to their bedroom or something like that if they've fallen asleep downstairs. 
um, or if you have a, a bed partner, you start prodding them um, when they are um, fully asleep. Um, you can actually provoke this and, and individuals may sit up in the bed, may look around in a confused manner. Um, and this confusional state can actually progress into sleepwalking if the subject leaves the bed. And people may have no recollection at all um, of this having happened whilst they were asleep or only some partial recollection and all sorts of embarrassing things can happen uh, during these type of uh, periods. These tend to occur during the first third of the sleep period. That's usually when we are having our slow wave sleep. Um, and during these periods of time, uh, people are unresponsive to external stimuli, more common in children. And the prevalence in the general adult population is actually quite common. It's about 7%. There are other variations of this too. We've talked about sleepwalking. Um, some people end up sleepwalking and going down to the kitchen and stuffing their faces. So you've got sleep-related eating disorder. Others, um, commonly children, may have night terrors, which can be very frightening for the children um, involved. And then we have the interesting uh, situation of sexomnia, where people um, have sexual intercourse whilst they are sleeping. And if you have a look at the prevalence uh, rates of these, uh, all of these conditions are actually much more common um, in childhood um, and they still remain fairly prevalent um, even in adulthood. So uh, pretty much a lot of these things are as common as carpal tunnel syndrome in the general population. So really this is quite a common thing. Let's talk about arousals briefly. Now, this is a, a slightly technical slide for more of the um, neurologists, uh, people involved in the sleep world, but we know that if people's um, EEG has a certain types of shifts in it that last for at least three seconds, going up to about 15 seconds, um, those are called arousals. Um, and um, we commonly see these. these are things which are graded within our polysomnography uh, grading of, of, of sleep and disturbances of sleep. So arousals are things which are quite common and are actually brief physiological awakenings. And in fact, as we get older, the number of normal amount of arousals that occur increase. So um, when we are younger, we may have 10 of these arousals per hour. They may creep up to something like 20, 25 as we get older. Interestingly, if we take uh, the example of obstructive uh, sleep apnea and you give people some uh, oxygen, um, then actually it makes very little difference to the number of arousals that they have during the night, which can actually be staggeringly high. So um, around about the sort of 40, 45, 50 uh, number of uh, times per hour that they can have these arousals. If we just go back to the previous slide, um, let's say if you're taking sort of the typical person, maybe mid 50s or so, um, would be expected to have about 20, 25 arousals uh, per hour. Um, these guys are having something like 45 give them a CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure support, and the number of arousals go down almost immediately and is sustained. So arousals are very common. Um, they become increasingly common as we get older, and we know older people do report poor quality sleep. Those who have obstructive sleep apnea, those who have a biological cause for having a high um, number of events of arousals can actually be treated for. This can be very reversible. And so, we have um, some good examples of wakefulness in, intruding into sleep. Now, how about the other way around, when you have intrusion of sleep into wakefulness? So uh, sleep deprivation is by far uh, the commonest uh, cause of this, um, and uh, the common causes would be biological, um, psychological, and social. And we can see impairment in people's attention, concentration, vigilance, memory, recall, and responsiveness whilst this is happening. And if you start measuring the brainwave, you can actually start seeing intrusion of slow wave activity, it might be local, regional, or global. Let's talk about microsleeps. Now, microsleeps are incredibly important for driver safety and operation of machinery. And you can actually see people um, having microsleeps. They behaviorally have certain changes, including a certain blank look about themselves, reduced responsiveness, their eye movement starts to slow. And in fact, these can be measured. These are measured in many modern cars. They look at your steering movements, your lane keeping. Um, some of them will do eye tracking, and some will also measure your interaction with various instruments. 
And so um, these are all behavioral markers of micro sleeps. We can also have a look at the EEG uh, whilst these are happening, and we can see certain slower wave intrusions um, into the usual activities of wakefulness, as well as a variety of other sort of physiological markers as well, such as reduction of blinking and slow rolling eye movements too. Cataplexy is a really fascinating condition. Now, usually when we go into our dream state of REM sleep, we have various physiological switches which basically cut off our ability to move of our skeletal muscles so we don't act out our dreams and, and come to harm. And these are reflected as reduced movements. Now, there's very complex and intricate circuitry around the brainstem which regulates all of this. And that suppressive circuitry, those sort of kind of kill switches which stop those signals descending down into our arms and legs and that we move along and, and, and end up harming ourselves whilst we're asleep, those can actually malfunction and be triggered whilst we are still conscious and that can occur in the state of cataplexy which uh, virtually exclusively affects those who have narcolepsy. So as we've explored so far, um, consciousness even by the great and the good is exceptionally difficult to define. Um, certainly there are aspects of wakefulness and awareness but actually there are other components too such as arousal and the motor systems um, as well which take part in this and these multiple components multiple systems and networks and structures all have to align and function appropriately and these can all be affected by circuit maturation circuit dysfunction and circuit deterioration thank you very much for watching i hope this has been interesting specifically as an introduction to the complex topic of consciousness and all the various networks and structures that surround that, the different systems that are involved. Um, please do consider supporting the channel by hitting the subscribe button down below, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. All the very best.